You better. Oh, too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'll just let everyone know we appear to have gone live. Okay, ready to go. Thank you. So, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Juliet Watson, the president of the Australian Women's and Gender Studies Association, and welcome to today's event 12 Rules for Academic Life A Stroppy Feminist Guide Through Teaching, Learning, Politics, and Jordan Peterson with Professor Tara Brapazon. On behalf of AUXA, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia. I'm coming from a lot of places today where we conduct our business. Land which is unceded. So we're coming from all over Australia, but I'm currently located in the northwestern suburbs of Melbourne. So I acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations and respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. I'm just going to say a little bit about AUGSA briefly. We've got lots of AUGSA members here today, but this event was opened up uh, beyond AUGSA. So there might be people joining today who don't know much about AUGSA. So the Australian Women's and Gender Studies Association is the peak body for representing researchers, academics, and students of women's studies and gender studies in Australia. And our purpose, which Tara will be talking to all of this, I think, to promote the teaching, study, and research of women's and gender studies in Australia, to be the national voice on women's and gender studies issues, and to promote links with other international feminist organisations and associations. We run a great conference every two years, um, the conference this year has been postponed until July next year, assuming everything <laughs> has calmed down. We'll be meeting up in Adelaide, so it would be fantastic to see as many people there as possible at Flinders University. We also have biennial prizes for our members. Um, we have one for the best thesis in women's and gender studies and one for the best uh, peer-reviewed journal article. We have a fortnightly e-digest, which promotes the work of our members. Um, so if you're not a member, please check out our website. Um, join, we're a really great group. <laughs> we'd, love, we'd love you to see it. We'd love to see you there. And this today is the first event of this kind that we've actually run by AUGSA, so we're very excited. Uh, I'd like to thank the AUGSA executive, which has worked hard to make this happen. In particular, I would like to thank Jane Marie Ma our tireless immediate past president and current treasurer for um, her unfailing support. I'd also like to single out Shauna Marks, our post-grad rep. Um, and it was Shauna who first suggested thinking about an event that we could do and actually came up with the suggestion of Tara Brabazon. So Shauna, you were the Colonel <laughs> for this to happen. Um, uh, I would also like to thank Tash Turgus and Amanda Fiedler, who are PhD students at the University of the Sunshine Coast, who are helping us with this Zoom meeting today. And alongside Gail Crimmins, who has kindly stepped in at the last minute from USC to help out with this. Finally, I would like to thank the Vice President of AUGSA and my very, very dear friend, dear friend to everyone, I think, on this panel, uh, Sarah Casey, without whom today's event would not have happened. Uh, you will never meet another person more enthusiastic and passionate about AUGSA. Now, unfortunately, Sarah is unwell and unable to be here, but we send her all our love and hope she's feeling better soon. A beautiful human, Juliet. A beautiful yes, human. a truly beautiful human. And thank you to everyone who is here today. The response to this event has been phenomenal. <laughs> it's overwhelming. We have had over 300 and 20 registrations. And this is all because of the reputation and calibre of our guest, fearless feminist, Professor Tara Brabazon. I've actually had to do an abbreviated biography for Tara because otherwise we'd never actually get to hear her speak because she has just done so much. <laughs> but I'll start with Tara Brabazon is the Dean of Graduate Research and Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University, Fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, and Director of the Popular Culture Collective. She has previously held academic positions in the UK, New Zealand and Canada, won six teaching awards, published, oh, I, have, I want to pick myself up off the floor, 19 books, <laughs> and has written over 200 refereed articles and contributed essays and opinion pieces on higher education in the arts. Tara was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2019. So I could say much more, but I want to hand over as quickly as I can to Tara, because you're not here to hear me, you're here to hear Tara. 
But I do just want to say that Tara will be speaking about her incredible podcast, which I hope uh, as many as possible of you have been able to listen to, um, at, that she recorded specifically for Augsa and that is still available through the Eventbrite invitation of Augsa social media. Um, Tara will be responding to questions from the Augsa executive and our audience. So please post any questions in this. Uh, we've got a question box on Zoom that you can use. We'll get to as many as we can and the questions will be managed by Gail Tash and Amanda. Finally, I'll let you know that we are recording this event. Welcome, Tara. Oh, Juliet, thank you. And look, Orksa is a, a big part of my heart belongs to this organisation and I just feel completely privileged to be a part of this event and this organisation during this troubling, challenging, brilliant, extraordinary, weird year. So together, let's try and make something extraordinary out of this difficult time. As I often say, it's the grit in the oyster that creates the pearl. So let's create some pearls today and I'll answer anything. I think there'll be many. Uh, so I, um, <laughs> I'm drawn to asking about laughing like a Medusa, but I know from uh, what's been happening online, I think that will be covered by other people because I think it's one of the most popular, popular rules that, <laughs> that you have talked about. So I actually want to talk about rule number five with you kick off with that which is which is where you discuss intellectual generosity mm. and particularly because i think this is something that is at the heart of augsa this is something that flourishes in augsa i speak from personal experience and i can probably speak on behalf i hope so of so many of our members that coming to augsa is like coming home yes. we you know this is where we find our people when we can feel quite isolated augsa is where our people are um, but we're in this current political climax, this anti-intellectual climate. Um, it's really difficult. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on maintaining that intellectual support, generosity, um, openness during these what are frightly precarious and terrifying times. Yes, and, and Juliet, thank you for that question. And, and colleagues, I'm just thrilled to answer it. Look, like a lot of us, we've worked in, and look, I, I'm concerned about the phrase, but I'll say it, toxic workplaces. We've worked in environments where leadership has been profoundly problematic, bullying has occurred, and our spirit and our intelligence and our hopes and our desires for the future have been crushed, have been crushed by diabolical behaviour from individuals, collectives and communities. So, as humans, we can decide what we're going to do about that. And what I decided to do in Canada, actually, when I'd gone through a particularly appalling environment where a colleague killed himself, uh, is that I said to myself, no more. And that's when I made a point of no matter what comes at me, whatever comes at my colleagues, at my friends, we will always respond with delicacy, with decency, because we, we never know what another colleague is going through, what's happening in their home environment. And so always responding with generosity and kindness and with a hand raised in hope and friendship, for me, that's always been why we got into this business. Because I think that the nature of academic life is we believe in the future and we believe that intelligent people have something to contribute to the planet. And we believe in, I often use the line that, we should honour the me, but work on the we. And that means we honour who we are, we respect who we are as individuals, we share who we are as individuals, and that's great and that's important. But then we work on the we. We work on how we build the relationships, we build the partnerships, we build the community, and that community can make us strong. So, Juliet, does that handle things a little bit? Yeah, no, it's, I think there's, I mean, the pearls have started, Tara. I think that, you know, that is something that is, you know, very, very pertinent to our members and I think the broader people who are here today. So thank you, Tara. I'm actually going to hand over to Shauna, um, our postgrad rep, because Shauna, you know, she is positioned in a very specific way in terms of, you know, what's next and what's happening with academia. So Shauna, would you like to? Thank you, Shauna. Pose a question. Myself. Okay, I've got to pick a question because I had a few questions to ask you, Tara. So, okay, I think that I will ask you, hmm, so how would we approach training organic academics in PhD, 
in PhD programs. So you talk about the organic academic, what would it take if we were gonna train PhDs in this way? And how would this approach to training potentially transform universities? Sean, a wonderful question. And so the organic intellectual is really what we are trying to do in research training. And can I say the phrase research training probably truncates or blocks us from the organic intellectual. But there is the public intellectual, which is the status quo intellectual. So the person that is getting the funding, providing the information that the conservative governments require in a timely fashion. So we wish everybody well with that function. The critical intellectual are the crew who are assembling an alternative worldview. And I always use Edward Said as the example of that. And Howard Zinn, uh, who, who Donald Trump mentioned earlier in the week as sort of destroying American history. So he did a pretty good job. So it's about creating that alternative worldview. And that's a value yeah. too. That's a vista of alternatives. But the organic intellectual is different because it is someone who holds the expertise and holds it to such a scale and scope, Shauna, that they're able to express it without dumbing it down to a diversity of communities. Mm. So in many ways, that is the future of higher degrees. It's the future of our universities. Because if we are interested in citizenship, and you certainly are, Shauna, if you're interested in citizenship, we have to be interested in information literacy, and we have to make sure that our citizenry receive timely information in a way that they can use in their own lives and beyond. So what we're trying to do in research training for an organic intellectual is making sure you have the expertise, you have to have the disciplinary literacy. So we can't muck about with that. But that's the first step. It's not the only step. So we make sure a diversity of dissemination pathways are available to you, whether it be on social media, whether it be through podcasts or video, whether it be through journalism. So you're able to demonstrate your expertise in anti-intellectual times by moving modality with care and decency and respect. So what we try and do in research training, therefore, is making sure you're getting the foundational expertise, which you need to pass a PhD, but that's not enough. Yeah. We need to make sure that you are able to gain a job, which we may talk about shortly, but you're also able to earn a living and you are able to contribute to citizenship, to provide your expertise and information to a diversity of citizens. So that's what we're trying to do. And how do you think that might change the university if we, across the board, started to think about from the beginning when we train researchers, how do they, how do they know how to talk about their research to anyone? Yes, what, I think what, what we've got to do is, is the, the training of a PhD student starts in the first lecture in first year. Mm -hmm. And the idea that someone magically enters a PhD program and suddenly we, we teach them these multimodal languages is mm. ridiculous, I think. We need to make sure that the undergraduate program is sound and clear and of standard. And then when someone enters a PhD, they understand the trajectory of their discipline, which is what mm. we're required to do, but mm. they understand the trajectory of all these different language modes. So we teach students about interface management. So mm. that's how I think the degree will change. And this is one of those weird moments, Shauna, where I think the doctoral program is actually ahead of the entire university. So because mm. it's smaller, and again, you and I are at Flinders, and because it's a thousand great people, it's small enough to make pretty radical changes in a program if you choose. So we have all sorts of different modes of PhD, all sorts of interesting people that come in. And we have a diverse group at Flinders. So our students range in age from 23 to 93. And the gift and the joy of that diversity is that we enable those students, but those students enable us. Mm. So, you know, it's student facing, but it's more than that, Shauna. We, we learn from students and we are here to serve students. So when we create a service mode of leadership, then I think our higher degree programs change radically because it's not a top down, let me tell you about the discipline. Mm -hmm. It's much more organic yeah. and it's a dialogue. Sounds great. Thanks, Tara. So I'll, I'll throw into the um, question box in a moment. It's just that we did get a question on Twitter that I think directly follows on from what you're talking about. So I'd like to just put that to you for the moment. And this is from Kel Purcell. Um, Kel! <laughs> and Kel's asking, what advice would you give women over 40 about to start their PhD? Bring it. 
Um, what, what I'd say is the average student starts at Flinders University at 40 years of age. So the first thing is you are not only welcome, you are normative, you are our future. And we're all going to live, please, um, a very, very long time. And so what I'd say to the extraordinary women and men and non-binary identifying community, our trans community, is that you are welcome on our campuses. You are so welcome. And the nature of our lives, the nature of the workplace is, it hasn't been linear for all about 30 years. So we welcome your next stage in life. So don't for one moment think it's a problem or it's an issue or it's a challenge because you are our normative group and all our systems and structures, as the wonderful Shauna pointed out, are geared for diversity. So this is not a deficit model of teaching and learning. We love and respect who you are and what you bring to a doctoral program. And we start with where you are rather than where we want you to be. Fantastic. So I am going to um, just ask Amanda, Tash and Gail if we've got a question that you'd like to put to us from the, the question box. <laughs> Um, hi, no questions at the moment, but it's picking up something that you mentioned a little earlier, Tara, and, and it actually both conversations or both pieces that you've said so far, that you were talking about meeting people where they are. Yeah. And in your podcast, you also talked about that beautiful interaction between Katie Lang yes. and Leonard Cohen. Yes. And there was this moment whereby both had very, very different kind of cultural experiences and, and they, were, they were culturally very different beings, but there was an acknowledgement and an acceptance um, and an acknowledgement of difference, but acceptance there. I wonder if you could perhaps talk a little more about that because you're talking about meeting students where they are, yes. learning from, learning with, and yes. how we may be, both as academics and as students, might position ourselves to be more porous, if you like, in that interaction. Oh, Gail, remarkable. And again, I will congratulate you on your wonderful book, which is incredibly porous and open and welcoming. And what a joyous read it is. So for me, that really is everything, Gail. For me, that's the definition of politics. I define politics as a struggle over meaning. And so what we, we must do is be open to that struggle. And so for me, I do a lot of work in sonic media. And for me, it is about listening and there's all this weird stuff Gail and you and I've talked about this in the past you know this no platform stuff and all, all this sort of you know right to right to say random stuff and we wish everybody well with that and and for me if we start everything with intellectual generosity and listening rather than I'm in charge and I'm going to tell you what's happening if we start with taking a step back and listening and caring then I think the world changes. So for me, the foundation of, of citizenship, I think, is reading and listening. And if you think about our contemporary university culture, it validates talking and particular modes of writing and citation. And that's fine, but I think if we start to take a step back and really listen to what people are saying, those listening cultures will transform our universities. And that comes from all of us, Gail, because that's how we, how we learn. And I think the problem with a lot of leadership structures and strategies in our universities and beyond is that it, it's very much about telling people about their own lives. And if I suppose as a characteristic of, of me as a, a feminist, me as a, as a left-wing activist, as a progressivist activist, it's always to just shut the hell up and listen and read widely and respect come to every engagement with respect and kindness and if we can all do that then then the world can change really and i think the tragedy for us gail is our universities are going beyond a scale and we're losing colleagues and you know the workforce is changing the workforce is profoundly unstable i'm on a contract i'm sure many of many of you on this call are on contracts and you know most of us are one day away from needing to find another job and how we maintain kindness and decency when we're frightened of the future i think that's the challenge but we have to start with that listening and that caring because the alternatives well we're seeing in the united states aren't we 
Thanks. That's beautiful. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. And I think the challenge is to, to have that compassion for the fact that other people are also frightened. Sometimes we, we often forget, I think, that other people are in that space of, of terror or fear or anxiety about what, what their future and their career or their being might be. So I think that's beautiful. I do have another question that I might pose that's coming from the question, um, the question and answer session here. And this is from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, Lisa. She's talking about um, the fact that she, she absolutely agrees with you around your thoughts about uh, needing to move our society from the neoliberal me to the collective we um, and the me is so entrenched and um, by the time students actually get to school or university or even to a postgraduate kind of engagement in education often the views are so solidified that me neoliberalized I, I, call, I call it that kind of responsibilized um, culture so it seems to Lisa that we need to go back to early childhood um, to kind of revamp education, if you like, as, from a radical kind of base. What are your thoughts on that, please? Oh, oh Gail, I have so many thoughts on that. What a wonderful question. As some of you may know, I, I was um, the professor of education and I was the head of school of teacher education at Charles Sturt University, a wonderful regional university, which I love with a passion. We've got CSU crew on the call. And I love you all very much. And what is happening to regional universities in this country is an absolute tragedy. And can I say one of the privileges of being a professor of education is that we taught everything from early childhood right the way through to higher education studies. And what I would say to you, Gail, is actually it's the early childhood crew and the higher education studies crew that had the most in common. And we had the most in common because they were the two groups that loved and validated play. And so for me, early childhood education is everything. It's where all the foundation of our lives and our hopes begin. And you know, I'm always fascinated. I used to have some fantastic curricular discussions with colleagues at CSU about you know, science for the, for the six, six months to 12 months. Now, these are fantastic. I mean, what, I said, what does that look like? And I saw the curriculum and it's just magnificent. It involves water and dirt. And if it involves water and dirt, then I'm there, right? So that's fantastic. So it's about validating play and bringing play back and bringing freedom and joy and kindness and space, Gail. I'm a big believer in space. You know, that, that everything, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment, which it, thankfully this gig let me stop and take a breath, but it's called The Claustropolitan University, the book I'm writing at the moment. And it's about everything being tight and closed and frightening. And we feel like we're on the edge of the world, as I'm sure a lot of colleagues feel. And, you know, the, the, the way we release ourselves from claustropolitanism is through space and laughter and breath and play. And these tropes for learning, which is how I treat them, these tropes for learning begin in the home, begin in the home and in the family, but are validated through early childhood. And we must continue through schools. And therefore, when crew come back to universities, we bring the play back and the pleasure and the breath. So that's my perspective. And I've always said, Gail, that early childhood and universities, we are the same. Can I say they should also be paid the same? So I might um, invite Camille Nurka. I know Camille has has questions, and Camille is one of our executive members for Orgsa. So go ahead, Camille. Oh, Lovely. thank you, and thanks, Satara, for your awesome lecture. Um, I'm going to be the annoying person in the audience who asks like a 10 minute question. Right. Um, it's just because there's a, there was a lot for me to engage with in your Please. lecture and I really loved it. So I wanted to just sort of say, and uh, this sort of question is kind of, um, I'm sort of referencing our members here, not necessarily myself because I'm not actually in the academy per se. I'm sort of like a para-academic. I'm sort of involved in it. Um, a bit, but sort of outside of it. And I think that's possibly a space where lots of exciting things can happen. Too, Agreed. Actually. Agreed. <laughs> but my question is, in your lecture, um, you talk about what it might mean, um, this is how I read it, to be an ethical intellectual 
in the contemporary world, as against the faux intellectualism of Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Um, in that respect, I think your lecture may well have been alternatively titled How Not to Be Jordan Peterson. But these were the things that you said, uh, the things you said that resonated with me about the importance, was about the importance of reading, yes. um, of intellectual generosity, which I think that that sparked something in all of us, actually, uh, of learning, of engaging with other scholars, of having a share or an investment in diverse scholarship. And one of the central pillars of the problem um, with the evacuation of ethical intellectualism from contemporary universities, which I think Peter Re Peterson represents, is time. So what I want to talk to you or what yeah. I want to ask you about is, is about time. And I feel like um, even though I'm not in the in university institution, I see that time is being stolen um, from my friends um, and a lot of the clients I have who I work with very closely um, by these kinds of corporate bureaucratic systems that are designed to measure productivity, which, you know, um, basically eradicate vital ethical engagements between people and turn them into these lifeless outputs. So I guess what I want to say, I'm going to cut this short. This is too long. No, you're doing well. Keep going, mate. <laughs> I think um, how do we in in your in your lecture you talk about um, doing as well as criticizing that criticizing it is is not enough it's not enough just to criticize to create straw figures that we can easily tear down like Jordan Peterson does but we must also try to build things coalitions relationships opportunities for others more vulnerable than us yes um, in some ways in some key ways to be an ethical intellectual yes. is to offer our time as a gift. And this is so much harder to do when time is in scarce supply. So I guess, what are your thoughts about um, time in universities and how can we best use time to occupy the space which you've just spoken about? Oh, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, firstly, I just adore you. You know that I just want to be you, you know that. <laughs> Time is everything. I mean, those of you that, that know me, and I've got a lot of friends on this call, time is so incredibly precious. Time is everything because we're dead a long time, as my 90-year-old mother would say. We're dead a long time. So time is precious. And I'm also aware, you know, I am a woman without children. So for all the women and men out there and colleagues out there that have children, uh, your time is not your own. So I have a lot more autonomy over my time. But what I would say, and again, this is bringing back sort of my leadership moment, one of my rules about leadership, is that I chose to take on a leadership role for many reasons. One, I'd seen truly trashy leadership that was killing people, so that focuses the mind. But the other reason, Camille, that I took on leadership was to buy time for others. So I took on leadership because I have a very low tolerance for nonsense. And so when I was first ahead of school, I went through what were the cycles of meetings. And the first thing I did is I transformed all 60 minute meetings into 30 minute meetings. And then I sat in all those 30 minute meetings and the meetings that were actually irrelevant or pointless or could have been an email became an email. So the first thing you need to do is structurally, I'm looking at Tash, the first thing you have to do is structurally make that change. So you, you are able to buy time for others by being shrewd, strategic and going, you know what, that meeting is just one bloke having a chat. And he can have a chat with himself in the toilet. He doesn't need to involve 20 other people, right? Knock yourself out. So it's about firstly structurally creating that time. And then you're able to bring back meaningful moments. And a lot of those meaningful moments involve research. So that's when the research can be shared with colleagues, the teaching and learning practices, the subtle can be shared with colleagues. The meaningful moments in our working and daily life can come back. But Camille, it has to start firstly with creating, again, I'm back there, Gail, creating the space, creating the space for silence, for thinking, and for listening and then if you're really listening to colleagues that ethical component Camille you talked about suddenly emerges because it's not about um, you know 
KPIs. It's not about KPIs because at the end of the day, I think we all know that KPIs are nonsense. Uh, there is a confusion between the urgent and the important. And what the ethical intellectual does is focuses on the important and not the urgent. And what I hope I do as an inverted commas leader is that I hopefully bring back that agency and that literacy and understanding the difference. Because I think the nature of the neoliberal university is we've all got terribly confused between busyness and work and high quality work that enables and value adds to our lives and the lives of others. So it's, it's reducing and really getting rid of and laughing at, we're talking about laughing, laughing at the culture of busyness. It's like, oh, let's, let's have this meeting. And actually calling it out too, Camille, like you're in a meeting and you know, we've all been in there and it takes sort of 20 minutes to go through the agenda and the minutes of the last meeting. And it's like, what has just happened? I've just lost 20 minutes of my life. When I'm 92, I'm going to want those 20 minutes. So it's about using the comedy of, right, so hasn't this been a great use of time? Wow, I'm enjoying this. Isn't this exciting? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's do these minutes. Let's do it. Come on. And, and just creating that sort of like, what exactly are we doing, team? So is this a good use of our life as really clever people? And look, if, if you're going through days, and this was always my test with my colleagues, it still is, that if you're going through a day where you haven't actually switched your higher processing skills on. So if you've actually, Gail, I'm looking at you. If you've actually just worked a day and actually the level of intellectual ability you've used is, is basically turning on the tap in the bathroom. If that's the highest level of scholarship you've used during that day, something's going wrong with your schedule. So it's time to look at Microsoft Office and make sure every day has an hour of higher thinking. And that's, I think, what leadership can do, Camille. Am I answering your question a bit, mate? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> chat. I've, got, I've got two comments. I've got a comment and a question on the chat. First of all, from Lynette. Thank you, Lynette. You're saying about listening cultures and they have so much to teach us. Um, but are the institutions listening or do the institutions always listen? Um, and always remember that we have two ears and one mouth listen twice as much as you talk. So I suppose that's a, it's, it's a comment, but perhaps it's a question around how can we support the institutions to become listening institutions? And before I move on, let's just want to consider there for a moment, Tara. There's a beautiful question here by Elaine um, from Elaine. And she's saying that, um, please talk to us women students from a poverty class heritage. I'm going to just pause there for a second because I think that really resonates with many of us um, students from and or academics from a poverty class heritage trying to be in colonial classist unis. Yes. So two really poignant and, and amazing comments or questions there to consider. And, and, and look how they are. And Elaine is a light in my life. And I learn from Elaine every single day. And Elaine, I love you. And she's coming to us from Canada. So it's pretty late in the night for, for Elaine. And I love you for that. And look, Elaine, our respect and decency and understanding of poverty won't transform in our universities until we broaden the base of our staff and students in our universities to be frank you know Karl Marx said life determines consciousness consciousness does not determine life if you take that seriously then your life transforms so look a lot of us came from a working class environment Gail and I have talked about this in the past and look that's not poverty that is a skilled working class environment for a lot of us. But again, Elaine, what people in my position and a lot of positions of, of colleagues on this call, what we can do is act in that critical intellectual function, not organic. We can translate between the culture of a university, which is an Oxbridge model, top end of town, it is training the already empowered to be in power. That's what universities do. Now, some of us accidentally, when the widening participation agenda came in, slid through the door. And didn't they enjoy that? So some of us bizarrely have made it through and somehow are sort of hanging on. Not very popular with the wrong accent, but we're holding on. And so our job is to open the door, kick that door open for the colleagues that follow and translate the experiences of disempowered communities for those that follow us. So I, can, I have never lived in poverty. Uh, I have come from a pretty tough working class background, but what I can do is translate and open the space 
for you to speak. And that is my job and that is my privilege, Elaine. And you need to speak and you need to speak often as you do and you need to finish that PhD and you need to transform the world. And I know you will. You are amazing. And Gail, just to that second point about listening cultures and power. Uh, look, it, it is a challenge. It is, uh, you know, Gail, I just sort of shake my head a lot. Uh, what I try and do and what I try and say is, and you know, I've published a lot as Juliet's wonderful introduction suggested, and I've gained from that because of digitization and disintermediation. So because a lot of academics are now running open access journals, and we must thank and love our colleagues for doing that, it has provided a plurality of platforms and interfaces for us to speak and write and work outside of the corporate infrastructure. Uh, and the gatekeepers, because I'm obviously, and Gail knows this, I'm obviously deeply concerned about the disciplinary gatekeepers that exist on this planet. And they actively keep out a range of communities, including women, uh, from, from the empowered people in, a, in multiplicity of disciplines. We know that, including Indigenous colleagues as well. Uh, we are so far away from a post-colonial reality, we can't even speak to it. Right. So what we need to try and do is, look, I'll be truthful on this, Gail, is in some ways we've got to shame the powerful. And one of the reasons I did all these crazy degrees that I've done and I publish like I publish is so when uh, the blokes in the polyester suits get up and go, I've published 10 books. And I go, have you, Dale? How, how great for you. That's just great, isn't it? That's terrific. Brilliant. And so there's, there's sort of the, the shaming of the powerful, and I hate going into the negative perspectives, but by creating those alternatives and showing that citizens, academics, organic intellectuals can get to success in a different way, uh, maybe that provides the models and the strategies and the structures for those that follow us. You know, I, I won't go any further than this job. <laughs> it's amazing I got today. No one's more surprised than me. And, and this is it, this is about as far as I can, I can go, um, keeping my integrity intact and keeping who I am intact. But for the people that follow us, I hope we've created some space for different ways of writing and reading and thinking and being an academic. I'd like well, that's to... perfect. Oh, sorry. Go for it, Julia. I was just uh, going to invite Jamery Ma, one of our executive members, who uh, I don't think anyone's been more excited about this presentation than Jamery. So I'd love to offer her the opportunity to. I love you forever. <laughs> Cara, I'm just listening to you and I'm watching. Um, watching the tweets flow in about people responding to your warmth and to your generosity. One of the things that, given it hasn't um, happened yet, that people, for me, the laugh of the Medusa and embodied critique, how we embody critique was something that spoke in quite a visceral way to me in your presentation. And I wondered, given that we now have your body with us, if you wanted to say something about that. Oh, look, Jamie, you are just a, a wonderful human. And I'm so glad we've had a chance to meet like this. And I just, I hope when all this sort of lockdown shutdown happens, you know, I will buy you uh, a posh coffee. <laughs> um, so look, look the, the embodiment, and can I say when I was thinking about how I was going to do this and when I was asked by the wonderful Sarah Casey and Juliet to be involved in this, we originally thought, do I sort of do a 30 minute lecture and have a question and answer? And then I think Juliet, it was ending up, I was going to do a video, I think. And then the, <laughs> then the content sort of expanded, Jane Marie, and it sort of ended up, you know, and I, I was aiming for an hour. To be frank with you, I was aiming for an hour and whoa, okay? And I was thinking about video. And then I thought, look, no, Jordan Peterson uh, occupied space and used video. And I wonder how interesting it would be for a heterosexual woman to offer a critique to a heterosexual man by voice only and embody the space sonically. And so 
that podcast could accompany people on walks at the gym and, and just be a gentle voice in the ear as they're living their life. So it ended up being an intentional choice. And I think, and Jamie, you, you and I know we've seen a lot of the, the emails and the tweets and so forth. It's ended up being much more emotional and deeper and meaningful for people because it's like I've been having a chat with people and I felt like that. So in terms of embodying a feminist critique, the voice matters. And of course, I went back to Sasu and for, for the colleagues on the call who are my age, I'm glad, Gail, I'm glad you did that too. Uh, look, I went back there because it is about recognising the body of a woman and the power of a woman's body without apology and recognising the sound, the vision, the space that we occupy is meaningful. And we have a right to occupy that space and we have a right to speak our truths and we have a right to breathe. And we have a right to laugh and we have a right to dance. And that is as meaningful and that is as powerful as any bloke on bloody YouTube sort yourself out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The, the room here is erupted with, with cheers and claps and, and, and joyous celebration. Um, but Gail, Tara, did you get another question from the, the question box? From the chat. Yeah, so I have two questions here. I'm going to start. So first of all, Jenny and Leanne, thank you so much for your patience. I'll come to both of your questions. Jenny's question, how does one deal with intolerance if we are to remain open-eared and we're to approach all interactions with kindness? How do then we shift the intolerant if we don't confront or call it out? It's an excellent question. Oh, and can I answer Jenny's first before I, I do Leanne's? And of course, colleagues on the executive know we had a bit of a, a moment of intolerance this morning as we were moving into this session today. Uh, we had um, a colleague, a wonderful colleague, who is a friend of mine, who I have enormous respect for, who has some challenges with the word woman and finds the word woman somewhat confronting. And I respect that enormously, and I respect that critique enormously. And just so colleagues on the call know, uh, and I will share this if the executive is comfortable, at about five o'clock this morning when these critiques were emerging, I made the judgment, I made the call that that wonderful colleague deserved this space. So that matter of difference or dissonance or concern, I welcomed and I welcomed by opening this space to that person. Uh, and that is how I handle things. I, I'm not adversarial. I'm not antagonistic at all. And in fact, those of you that, that know a lot of my management style, I call it dropping the tug of war rope. So when someone gives me a, a tug of war, I don't pull, I drop. And I wish them well. And I wish them well. So it is about opening platforms. It's about being courageous. And as I said to the executive, it, it's about sort of transforming life into a Yoko Ono 1968 performance art experiment. And as I've got older, I've got sort of cooler with that. It's like, let's just open a door and see what happens. So that's the thing of think about aging is that we can be much more tolerant by not having expectations about this is how life will be. It's about opening spaces. And I hope, I mean, my, my rule 12 was, well, what was my rule 12? Was it be the change you want to see? So hopefully I'm, I'm not a hypocrite and I approach everything with openness that I'm not wedded to the outcome. I'm enjoying the process, the day is good, and you know we, we wish the future well. So is, does that sort of answer the question? I think it answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Um, we might go to another question from our, our audience. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, thank you. I have a friend who says that he takes himself to school each day. And I think that that's what you've just demonstrated, Tara. Um, thank you. So, yes, we've got a question here from Leanne. And she said that Steve said that men need feminism. The world needs feminism. Everybody needs feminism. But the, um, men need feminism to keep them in check. What's the role of men's studies intervening in the styles of manhood validated by Peterson? 
Right. So, so just so you know, that's Dr. Leanne McRae on the call. That was my PhD student. Leanne, I'm going to give the year. I think about 2002 you finished. Hashtag no pressure. And of course, um, Leanne was the best man at Steve's in my wedding. Just so you know the scale and scope of this. So my beloved late husband, Professor Steve Redhead, was heavily influenced, and that's not a strong enough phrase, by Professor Bev Skeggs. Bev Skeggs changed his life. Changed his life. And he was, he was always, do you remember with the pussy grabbing moment from Trump? Do you remember that sort of moment? How could any of us forget? But, but, and when men were going, oh, men don't talk like that. Steve said, firstly, men talk exactly like that. That's how men talk. And I went, okay. And, and at that point, he said the immortal line. I think he said it to Leanne in an interview too, um, that men must be patrolled by feminism. Now, can I say, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but it is an interesting statement from a late, wonderful, very senior scholar, six foot two, 15 stone, men need to be patrolled because they, do, <laughs> they can't be trusted. Now, I think that's wrong, and I told Steve it was wrong at the time, but I think he's aware from, a, he was aware from a socio-legal perspective, the role of feminist jurisprudence in transforming law. So I think that had a huge impact on him. But in terms of men's studies, Leanne, as you know, because you taught it with me 20 years ago, I taught men's studies. I taught masculinity studies. Uh, I believe desperately in men writing about men. I think that's incredibly important. Jeff Hearn changed my life. And I'm also aware that Steve Winlow, uh, Simon Winlow and Steve Hall ultra-realist criminologists in the UK, wrote a remarkable book called The Rise of the Right. Uh, that was uh, Gail on the uh, English Defence League. So uh, white working class men no longer in work. And they did an ethnographic study of that. And it is hard reading. It's hard reading because these men demonstrate xenophobia, racism, and sexism, and it's hard to read, but it is important for feminist scholars to read that, because I think when men have done that ethnographic work, it is transformative of masculinity. And I think we can hope <laughs> that feminism patrols masculinity. That's not my vibe, to be honest with you. I understand why Steve said it, but for me, I am and remain deeply and passionately committed to men working in men's studies and masculinity and constructing alternatives and spaces and voices and modalities for men to be and think and do differently. And that's my politics. And it will be uncomfortable for feminists to read that work, noting that we've got fantastic men that are also feminists. A vagina has nothing to do with your politics. We know that, but I'm a big believer in men engaging other men in different ways of thinking. I believe in that. Can I just check if there's anyone else from our exec who would like to pose a question? Otherwise, I'll open it up to the chat box again. Um, does anyone on the exec want to put their hands up? Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, thank you. Suzanne, um, I'll just let you know, is our treasure, uh, sorry, our secretary of all. It's not a good treasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, magnificent, Suzanne. Hi, darling. Hi, thank you, thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to your response to um, Camille's question, which was which was great. Um, and I was, and I agree with everything that you said. I was thinking about how to do those things in terms of this. I guess the model of collegiality. I guess you were talking about when so much of the academic workforce is casualised um, and doesn't have, in my experience. The opportunity to be part of those conversations. So I would really uh, welcome your ideas on how um, to deal with that. Oh, Suzanne, what a, what a tremendous question. And to be honest with you, most days, including this morning when I was prepping for this, I, I physically weep for the precariat workforce of international higher education. It physically hurts me, okay, because it is like we are eating our own young. And it's, I guess my point is it's most of the academic work. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, in the United States, we've got colleagues from the United States, I think the adjunct academy yeah. is about 80% of academics. It's now at 80%. So, Suzanne, what I would do is almost we're at the point now where we're creating alternative 
higher education structures. Okay. Um, there was, you know, the, the communist university of Great Britain was a great model in the 1970s. So it was simply a group of really brilliant people that got together sort of outside of the institution okay. and created something new and different. It's almost sort of an Illich de-schooling society. Maybe we need to de-universitivise our society and structure. But what I think it involves, Suzanne, is the one gift we do have, the one gift we do have is digitisation. And yes, digitisation can be toxic and you know the keyboard warriors bless and all that stuff but Suzanne what we as colleagues have to do is I have to read your work I have to support you in your work and I have to cite your work there's a politics to citation so we have to lift each other up we have to we have to commit to you know you are a remarkable person a remarkable scholar and I enable your publishing I enable your voice and I cite your voice and it's not about the ranking of journals bless good luck with that tier one I hope it goes well bless it's about respecting the work and respecting the brilliant people. And I think, as we all know now, the great voices, the innovative voices, the brilliant voices are not happening in the posh end of town, in the posh universities. The innovation, the edginess is coming from the precariat workforce. Now, the problem we've got, Suzanne, is how do you pay your bills? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no, Suzanne, thanks. I'm just aware of time and we've only got a few more minutes left. So um, thank you so much to everyone who's contributed questions from the executive and from our audience today. Uh, we got to as many as we could. I just want to finish with one final question, Tara, before we finish up for today. Oh, goodness. And, yeah, that is, uh, and it's actually referring to Rule 12, which you mentioned before, be the change you want to see. And we've talked a lot about the precariat, um, you know, the casualisation. We have a government that just hates us. <laughs> I don't want to put it any other way. How do you maintain your optimism? Look, Julia, it is an amazing thing. And look, I, I do, but and I'll, I'll try and give an honest answer. How I maintain my optimism is I try and live a good day today. Uh, since everything that's happened to me in the last two, five, ten years, you know, I, I used to be very future oriented and I, I'm not now. I try and live a good day, a caring, decent, out there, passionate, good day. I go to bed and tomorrow morning I wake up and I try and do a good, decent, passionate day. Uh, and I think that's, you know, in, in terms of Suzanne's point, I think that's the other one too. It's like try and live the good day. And I think if 2020 has taught us anything, Julia, it is that the future isn't promised. And all we can do is fight the good fight today, believe, care, create the spaces, create the listening, create the opportunities for others, create those spaces, open those spaces up and hope that tomorrow is a better day. And let's be honest, there are some days this year that have been so traumatic that tomorrow has to be a better day. And all I know is if we can move from the me to the we, then tomorrow will be better. And let's hope we can do that. Thank you so much, Tara. I am going to draw this session to an end. Um, this is our, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is our first uh, online event that we've hosted in this capacity. And I think I can speak on behalf of the exec and say, it has surpassed all our expectations. We, we, we're just so, so honoured, Tara, for the time you've taken today, but also the time that you put into creating this incredible resource that is there for us to reflect on, to go back to. Uh, I mean, I know I'm going to be thinking about both today and your podcast for a long time to come. We talked about time. Well, there's a lot of time that I'm going to spend thinking about it. So thank you. So can I just say, Julia, it's been a privilege to be of service to you all. And I hope today is a good day and tomorrow is a better one. Today has been a fantastic day and in large part to you and also my executive colleagues, my feminist sisters and everyone who's come along today. Um, a quick plug, join AUXA. We're hoping, we wanted to see how this went and we're going to see um, if, if it's possible to continue uh, events like this in the future. Um, so thank you everyone. It's been a pleasure hosting this today and we'll see you down the track. Love you all. Have a lovely day. Thank you for your time. Bye.